loved your soil theory, though. Uh, sorry, you were saying? I was saying that I love Klaus's soil story. Like, I like the way it came out, like that kind of fairy tale thing. You know, it had a really nice tone to it that I could see wanting to add to. Cool. Um, so we can start in, right? That's kind of where I was going to head. Um, this is, uh, uh, we're sort of, the Marley calls have kind of ended, I think. Uh, Klaus, are you okay if we call this the Neo book call? Yeah, good. Sounds great. I will rename the channel. Uh, and we can we can figure that out. So this is the Neo book call for Monday, June twelfth, twenty twenty three. Um, and uh, do you want to, Klaus? Do you want to check in with what your current thoughts are and what, uh, yeah. like, the, the 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 email you forwarded to us about uh, maybe a children's book and other stuff like that? Yeah, I mean, coming out of our conversation last Monday was this idea of using. Uh, a parable you know, or uh, more of a story format to convey uh, uh, to, to convey an emotional uh, uh, content there, create an emotional connection. So that's why I engaged my chat GPT <laughs> to, um, you know, to write a story. And then so I tested it. Um, I'm uh, traveling with a small group at the Sarah, it's a leadership group within the Sierra Club, it's the National Grassroots Network. And I just, you know, what do you guys think about it? And the response was amazing. Um, they want to put it on their website. Um, and then I got this uh, uh, note from uh, this lady uh, in Kansas who wants to put on a child's play with it, you know, and turn it into a play. And when you think about uh, you know, the, the how powerful this could be, right? To to now uh, uh, play act out, uh, play act um, the story of soil, because we have been looking for some kind of of mechanism that cuts through. You know, and you can't. Uh, uh, I mean, it's really hard to to convey this technical story of what happens in the soil and. Um, so, so to to make this emotional, uh, uh, if if that that seems to be a potential pathway, I remember also when my when my son looked at um, one of my powerpoints, and there was one image in there that had a spoon full of soil, and then it pointed out that there are there are more microbes living in this spoon of soil than there are people on the planet, and that just floored him. I mean, I remember the. Because his reaction was just like, "Wow, that's amazing!" Yeah. <clears throat> so, so that's that's where um, where this came from. And then, of course, when you crowdsource ideas like this, I mean, you could you get stuff back that you just—I mean, I didn't think of uh, turning this into a play. I just thought, where where could this go? Yeah. Um, but I think it's just a, a phenomenal idea, and what I would love to do, you know, if we can pull that off is connect them, connect uh, this group, this church, with some resources that can help them to really knock this out of the ballpark. You know? um, cool. Hi, Patty. Thanks for joining. Hi, everyone. Um, so I think uh, just from the perspective of like this project and what we're doing, it sort of doesn't matter what format the book is in or who the audience is or whatever. It just has to sort of look and look like a duck talk like a duck and it's like it's like a neo duck um and so so that sounds great i have next to no expertise writing children's books or plays so we would need to find people or crowdsource uh some some ability to do that but if we if we seeded the not more than a skeleton if we seeded sort of the the straw man script uh and then had people come in and contribute to it and and you know do stuff to it that could be really interesting we um we don't want the process to take too long because this is supposed to be a quick first book. But if we like, like if we started somewhere quickly, we might be able to to get there. And, and then I'm I'm aware that most children's books are half the work is the script and half the work is the artist. And uh, you know that there's those collaborations are hard to find the good ones where where like the art really complements uh, the writing and all of that. But they're pretty important. I don't know if they're essential to doing a children's book, certainly not for a play. Uh, Stacy, I would really like to bring in that kid that I was talking about last time because I had given his artwork to Barry and Barry created a story, you, you know, using ChatGPT. 
So this kid really wants to provide artwork. So I would love to be able to bring him in. And he's very interested in computers, super, super smart, and could really use an opportunity. Sounds great. We can give that a try right? and um, figure out how to do, sort of how to do that. Um, so Klaus, I want to make sure that like I'm on the right version of the story of soil and all of that. Can you share the link to the document in the chat if you've got it handy? Sure. And then I, I've got a version of it open, but I'm not sure I'm on the right latest version. I just want to make sure that we're on the same page. Yeah, I haven't uh, changed the location of it. Um, so hopefully it's still the same. I mean, cool. it should be the same. Cool, cool, cool. Um, so I just I just expanded uh, on there. I mean, after you know, this idea came through, I just went back to chat GPT and write me a script. <laughs> and it wrote a script, you know. But, you know. Um, and uh, um, so what, so what I'm what I'm thinking so Jerry is that this this thing could be taken into into much more uh, elaborate uh, uh, audiences, right? I mean, you can start with a children's book, but I can see some abstract theater really emotionalizing this, making this a drama. You know, um, I mean, you can take this into any into any direction if this is the kind of communication that hits through, you know, that penetrates, uh, then we can advance this and and uh, and start from a children's play, child's play perspective, but then carry this into a more abstract, more mature audience. Um, thank you. And that was a different link from the one I had. So I will I will go back and, and read this one better. Um, and you, what you were saying just reminded me of something that would be worth looking at. Oh, I know. Um, the understory and a couple other sort of related um, uh, novels around this theme. And the understory is definitely not <clears throat> definitely not a kid's book, um, but it's it's definitely a dramatization of what happens around uh, nature uh, in really interesting ways. And I think it would be useful just to get a couple, a little bag of examples of near neighbor projects uh, that are kind of in this realm. Because I'm sure that there are plays about Gaia and about the earth and about things like that that are already out there in the world. We just don't know them yet. And we, if we each do a little bit of searching between now and next week, we'll have a, a tiny collection of, of uh, kind of benchmarks or role models or uh, whatever you want to want to call that. And then it's possible to have ChatGPT rewrite things at different grade levels or for different audiences. And so what you just said makes like a lot of sense. Uh, the question then is how we go about, you know, editing the chunks and, and connecting them and, and, and so forth. Yeah, we could also, um, and this is where I, I you know, posted the question, how do we protect this from a copyright perspective? And Know, maintain some kind of ownership for OGM uh, for this body of work. Um, uh, so, so if we if we could strike an agreement with this church that wants to turn this into a child's play, apparently um, the lady that responded uh, is doing this, you know, as a as sort of a, as a volunteer. So she must have she most likely has a background in uh in in uh what's her name marion thomas yeah so she most likely has a background in doing these sorts of things now and, and church is uh, uh, a perfect playground for hobby uh, you know, uh artists of all sort um so if we and she offered that you know I'm, i can turn this into a short play and and give that back to you basically wow i mean she was uh well, how did she frame it? If you like the basic idea of turning your story into a play, I would be happy to send you any adaptation I come up with for your approval or correction. You know, so we could engage into a relationship where we can ping pong this back and forth and advance it. And then it's still ours, you know? So it feels like the initial, <clears throat> it feels like the initial offer should have some kind of copyright, like Creative Commons licensing on it. 
just putting something in the public domain apparently is the wrong thing to do because that removes all kinds of copyright from the work. It basically says this work is unprotected. That means anybody else picks it up, takes it, puts a copyright on, and it's theirs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you have to, to sort of defensively, you have to put some kind of either CC0, uh, Pete Kaminsky likes copy heart, which I don't know much about, and I don't know which is the best way to go about creating a protecting a collaborative work that could then have other variants. And if she was going to create a play out of it, uh, then maybe she would register a copyright of this same sort for that variant of it, or would it be put back into the pool of this one? I don't know, but I have a feeling that if she if she created a, uh, uh, if she riffed on the, the beginning of it and created her own derivative work, that she would then uh, have rights over that piece of it. But it would be nice if, at least from my perspective, it would be really interesting if we could agree on those ground rules with her going into this so that when she did the work and put it, sent it back to us, we knew we knew that it was usable in the open way that we're looking to use all the materials that we create, right? As opposed, yeah. to, as opposed to, hey, I did a play, I riffed on it, and I put it under my copyright, and thank you so much. Um, so we have good, we have good and not so good, right? I mean, the good thing is that we have a product that uh, that seems to have legs, um, and we couldn't have anticipated this, right? I mean, when we started uh, creating contractual ideas and structural ideas and so on, we couldn't anticipate where this would go. So now we know where it has a possibility to go, and but now we're scrambling, you know, trying to put a put a bow around it from from a copyright licensing contractual perspective and I know nothing about those things um so so I mean you know at least at least we have something tangible to work with mm -hmm. and I honestly I mean I was thinking about this yesterday you know one of those times when you lay in bed and you can't sleep um and and I mean I can see this go into into uh, a, a more abstract form of play Right, where where you can really emotionalize this. So this is I'm this in the spirit of brainstorming. Um, tell me if you like this idea. Uh, what if the play were somehow uh, customizable to every school that decides to play it? Uh, both from the protagonists and the characters wind up being characters in the community of the school, but also. The issues and so forth are about of the bioregion that the play that the school is actually in. So that suddenly we bring in the bioregional things. So that if the school is in <coughs> the middle of Arizona and it's not a tropical rainforest, that the that the kinds of language and and, and topics of it uh, would be that way. Uh, you know, would be a, of that nature. Um, it might be a little too complicated, but if we're using ChatGPT to do some of this, we could actually uh, leverage that for the customization in some sense. Um, and it could, what I'm trying to figure out is what would be a cool and viral way to go about doing this that, that improves our mission, that basically feeds our mission of propagating the ideas and getting kids to learn about this and be excited and getting adults to be equally excited, right? Does that, does that sound interesting? Yeah. I I don't, that doesn't have to be complicated uh, because once you have a basic script, then you insert the images based on your local uh, kind of flora and fauna. You know? And, and uh, so you can just change out the images and the costumes and, and uh, just maintain the basic story. Yeah. I, um, I love that idea. And I would imagine that I'm just thinking of um, populations or areas where, let's say, we have a school in the Midwest, and let's say the the folks who are receiving the um, they like the idea of hosting the play, creating the play, um, uh, adjusting it to suit and reflect their bioregion, and they can imagine that happening in a space where there might not be anyone who even knows where to begin looking for information that's especially accurate, that's up to date, and that could. Um, so I wonder if there's a way to create some kind of like if if we move forward in this way with this project, we create some kind of pathway or. Um, uh, trail for people to follow if they're new to educating around biodiversity, bioregion, and um, uh, um, a way for them to educate themselves fairly easily with quality and um, updated information is what's coming to mind for me. I love that. And and a part of what Neobook is supposed to do is that each of the nuggets leads you into the web, into the background behind the nuggets and resources. 
and communities and all that good stuff. And I think those resources could also be tuned to grade level or age level um, so that a set of resources about what do you do about soil could be appropriate for a seven-year-old uh, and a separate set of resources would be appropriate for a 17-year-olds or thereabouts. Um, that would make a lot of sense to me. Um, and, and how to do this, there's like a green evangelical movement. Um, it's very interesting if, if, you know, if we're working out with churches, not schools, and I know that in my head, I was just slipping towards schools instead of churches, but really the conversation started, Klaus, because you were approached by a woman from a church. Um, there is a green evangelical movement that's pretty interesting. It's, it's, um, it's evangelicals who really think that our job is to be stewards of the earth. Sound familiar? Um, and if we could find something that fits that community well and transports itself well uh, in, in, in that world, that would be pretty awesome. Yeah, yeah. This, this concept of uh, stewardship, I think, needs to be explored further. We, we briefly touched on that last Thursday, and I, I spent a little bit more time on it. Yep. Um, I mean, there, there, there really is a complete uh, uh, misconception about the biblical concept, gen the, the Genesis concept of what is stewardship. And when you start digging into the literature, um, the the idea of explore of exploiting the earth resources is not biblical at all. Uh, it is it is uh, um, uh, it, it is responsibly sustainably engaging you know with the natural environment uh it just has taken you know, on a different approach but this would be a nice link with the church community i mean let's face it you know the the um the evangelical movement or the christian movement in general is just completely lost uh, in 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 where they should engage and how they should engage to make this world to more to look more like what uh, their understanding is of morality and living together and, and things like that, right? So um, this could really be sort of an escape valve of uh, this is non-political. No? Uh, you don't have to talk about what this means to farmers and food and all this stuff. I mean, you're just really engaging in a very raw, basic, basic uh, understanding linkage to, to the natural world in its most basic sense you know and then from there you can you know people can spin this out any which way they want but we could we can insert this and now that i'm thinking we can insert this concept uh, as a conclusion you know that uh, god wants us to be stewards uh, of the earth and what does that really mean right um I'm noticing that my tendency on all projects is to complexify them quickly into what they could be, and that tends to make things a little bit big and complicated. Um, so it would be lovely to sort of pair this back for a moment to the quick first book to figure out what's what's in the text that we offer her. We have this side conversation to have about under what copyright scheme should that work exist. Um, but I think our immediate work is to figure out, uh, given the text that you've shared with us, um, where you know how do we uh, how do we divide and conquer? How do we make it better? What do we want to do with it? What do you want it to be more like? Uh, what you know, when you said it, we could easily flesh it out more in, in lots of different ways, I, I agree. It could it could be many more things, um, but I'm wondering what that is. Go ahead, Patty. Thanks. Um, I, I love the direction this is going. Um, Klaus, I really appreciated that point. I love the idea of harnessing this. Um, uh, this is my language for it, like, kind of like lost set or lost energy. Maybe there's so much I can tell there's, um, and it, it seems to me that there is still a lot of willingness and um, momentum in the Christian movement. And, and as you say, you know, maybe not so much uh, what feels like, a, um, eh, like, um, I'm going to be careful here with, with how I say it. Um, that to me feels like a really relevant and modern and um, neutral space to funnel that energy that also could perhaps, if, if this were to really gain momentum in that direction, really serve as a way to uh, maybe heal the divide I've seen between um, uh, hyper, maybe like hyper intellectual or intellectual space and the Christian space. And there is, there, there, I have witnessed in my experience this kind of 
um, you know, two parties that may not know how to bridge this gap. And I could see that potentially being the space where two sides could begin to move in, um, into a shared cause and a shared understanding. Um, I, I think there's also um, potential here if, if um, I'm trying to think of other movements in the past that have um, gained momentum without using like shame, fear, um, and, uh, you know, like disempowering the, the people who are part of the movement. And I, I, I don't know, I don't remember much about how uh, the script, the societal script around cigarette use flipped because it didn't it used to be perceived as this thing that was very it was uh, advertised as this thing that was very cool trendy you know that I think might, might have been a little before my time and then wasn't there a campaign that fairly quickly shifted the um, societal lens around that and wasn't it something that was just kind of like you know portraying it as less cool than um than it had been advertised or portrayed in the past is that even close I might be totally off base about that I could use some help here I think there were many campaigns to try to make cigarette smoking uncool. I think that was a, a path taken a lot. I don't know. I, I'm not remembering one that particularly worked or caught on fire. Mm, well, they, yeah. they stopped allowing using smoking on TV. You aren't allowed yeah. to smoke oh. on TV. Yeah. Oh, okay. It's, inter it's interesting that that for both smoking and seatbelts, two things I can think of offhand, mm -hmm. uh, there was general public like, no, 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 we love our smoking. We don't want seatbelts. They constrain us. And then both of those things got made into laws and like smoking is down to, I don't know, 15% of, of, of uh, Americans or something like that at this point. And it was like 19 or 20 pretty recently. So it's still still on a downward trend and seat, not only seat belts, but shoulder belts and airbags and anti-lock brakes and now radar warning systems and like radar domes that fit on top of your, um, like we're going like safety went all, you know, all in. I, I was surprised at how quickly, I was surprised that anti-lock braking and airbags were even feasible so inexpensively, right? Because mm -hmm. anti-lock brakes start with airliners. Like airplanes uh, figure out how to do anti-lock brakes so that airplanes don't skid on landing. It turns out that that's really important and that's a really expensive device and boom. And from there to your car on all four wheels, et cetera, that's insane, but it happened. Anyway, sorry for the tangent. Um, go ahead, Penny. No, not, not at all. And it does the other example I was reaching for was the seatbelts, um, because that I think I remember that happening like fairly quickly, that societal like acceptance, like, oh, okay, sure, you know, was like, kind of odd and strange in the larger context of things we've been asked to change or step into that we may not have wanted. Um, and so I'm, I'm just thinking of the story. And I wonder if we can find some way to um, uh, man, if it'd be so cool if we could find a way to bring uh, this neutralizing undertone and when I say neutralizing undertone I mean you know if 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 the environmental movement is can't you know can be perceived as polarized or charged or I don't want it that's inconvenient for me like can we um, create some kind of mechanism within the play within the story that acts as or has a similar um, function not function a similar um, impact or similar leveraging similar emotional buttons as those other two movements, or at least the seatbelt movement may have had. Can we find a way to create, um, re this, re or put energy towards the story of cohesiveness and we think versus me think? And isn't there some kind of evolutionary um, uh, benefit and or not punishment, but wasn't like there, there's something in us that wants to is, is, has been um like we think serves the tribe i, I just I, I suspect there's some kind of emotional something we can appeal to that can help us come back to that and remember that and i'm wondering what it would look like to bring any of those elements into this play in the story that could be potentially rep replicable and um grow and we're growing a story that is empowering rather than divisive as much as possible mm -hmm. I agree. And as I'm sort of reflecting on this, it feels really touchy and complicated because for both smoking and seatbelts, I think one of the strategies was we're going to show everybody graphic images of what happens when you smoke a lot. Here's your oh. lung on cigarettes. And, oh. and, and also uh, we're going to show you like dead people from car accidents who got thrown out the window and all that kind of stuff. Mm. And that was yucky and didn't, I don't know how well that worked. I, I imagine that seeing how horrible your lungs get turned a couple people off. But then also in both cases, this was seen as government intrusion. 
And that is a very hot topic right now. So it's like, no, the government's not going to tell me what to do. This should be a local matter. Let me decide. It's like, no, for things like that, you kind of need to decide at a big, like, like slavery can't be a local issue. You can't have some states that are like, you know, slavery is okay. We still like slavery. Uh, you, you can't do that. And I think that public safety is sort of like that. But then, but then public safety gets touchy at different points. It's like, uh, should microaggressions be a question of public safety? Whoa, that would be a really huge issue, right? So, so you could argue that soil fertility, soil health, and all of this is a public safety issue and should follow similar paths. But as I'm just sort of trying to explore, they sound really touchy. And I think that it feels to me like there's a piece of this that needs to be, at least in the context we're talking about here, semi-spiritual and sort of narrative, emotional, and spiritual, those things will, will work and will, will connect. Uh, and I don't even know exactly what kind of spirituality that means. It might, in fact, be that the book varies by denomination. Got me. I don't know. Um, but, but, but heading toward regulations and heading toward science and facts and all those kinds of things in the context we're talking about sounds counterproductive, alas. But a piece of what, Klaus, what you wrote and what this is intended to be is a clarification of the scientific real-world relationships between <clears throat> all the components of these complicated systems and how they keep us alive. So what do we do with that? Go ahead, Penny. Oh, um, thanks, Jerry. As an aside, uh, just something else that's coming up for me. This isn't so much speaking to what you were sharing, Jerry, but just popped in. Um, I'm wondering, too, how we can keep in the story, how we can craft the story so that it keeps um, the potential viewers out of the uh, overwhelm, shame, shutdown tendency that can so often happen in these conversations, especially when there um, might not be a lot of education around the topics. And it just seems like this huge, you know, like, I don't know how to even begin to understand this problem. It's so big. It's, you know, and it's really calling... I would say us all into, you know, um, a time down the road that that hasn't quite happened yet. And we know that it's happening now and that, you know, things are progressing very, very in a very real way, in a very fast way at present. But I don't think um, I don't think everyone sees it like that. And I wonder how we can keep this accessible for that's probably the word I'm looking for accessible for anyone who might be newer or introduce, you know, coming into this conversation. Mm hmm. Um, so like, I think maybe a design goal for the quick first book is some version of simplicity to avoid overwhelm and some version of looking up, not looking down to avoid shame. Right. Yeah. Uh, put it, I like the idea of you know, putting it into a spiritual context. You know the the idea of stewardship uh, because when it and and I can see this play out in churches uh, because the audience that you that you get and I spent you know quite a bit of uh, time uh, uh, a period in my life where we would go to church regularly to an evangelical free church and and I was actually a leader in the church um, so I'm I'm familiar with the emotional context you know, of uh, of this. Um, and they're good people. I mean, they're really well-meaning, good people who want to do the right thing, basically. You know, and, and uh, the noise and the distraction in the system just makes a mess of it. Um, so this has um, this this you now provides um, a, a, a politically context-free. Um, uh, way of understanding the natural world and how important it is to, to, uh, that the soil be kept uh, healthy. And we don't need to go into you know, any of the implications. What does this really mean now? Right? Um, we can approach that. You know, once there's an interest in there, then we can we can continue talking. You know? But to, to leave this sort of in this shell that it is in right now, you know, um, 
and maybe end it with the concept of stewardship. We're the stewards of nature. You know, we need to take care of it. And people can translate this into planting trees you now and, and into uh, uh, cleaning up, you know, uh, recycling and all kinds of things. Now, or they can go further and and uh, look at you know what our food system and uh, water pollution and all of those things. Now, but we can then leave that up to what people take out of it. Other thoughts, reactions. I I like the um, as I'm thinking of this more, I love the idea of deploying this idea in in the medium through the medium of a play in the context of a um, church community setting. That's already, I mean, I would hope in many instances that's already a space where a community is established. There's hopefully some sense of safe, uh, sense of safety within that community that is established, and thus I think uh, messages tend to land a little differently where those two elements are present. And rather than if I'm just sitting on one side of the screen by myself, and this is a new concept for me, like there, there's a that kind of built-in sense of um, or like a not landing cushion, a softer landing, I think for new ideas, perhaps in, in spaces like this. So I think it's really exciting that this opportunity arose and the more I'm thinking about it, the more excited I'm feeling about it. Cool. Um... I, 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 it's very funny. I, the, I, I'm sort of with you on Pat, on Patty on how I'm feeling about the project and this potential. And then I'm, I'm, I know very much that this is not, this is, I am out of my depth in the, the context and content that we're talking about. And uh, I just want to be a, a, a steward of the process and, and other sorts of things and figure out how to get there without dabbling so much that I, that I fuck it up. Um, so to speak. Well, they're all flying by the seats of our pants here. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. That's the ticket. Um, so a piece of this is building good relationships with people who are excited by the prospect of helping and and figuring that out. Uh, so for that, we kind of need the, we, we we need some some work on hey, what's the what's a good copyright um, to put this under. Um, and I think a way of, uh, and maybe we just asked this of ChatGPT also. <clears throat> That's probably a good idea, Klaus, if you wanted to play with ChatGPT, but to ask it, uh, and I, I added a couple questions, by the way, to your ChatGPT prompts document hmm. um, about the, not in the context of a children's book or a play for for churches, but rather in the context of just a, a book, a quick first book about bioregionalism. Um, but the question here to ChatGPT would just be, um, for a, a collaborative book that is meant to be in the commons, what is the best copyright to use? Something like that. I'm, I'm just curious, Klaus, what bioregion is this particular church in? Because I would assume that would be the first one that we would start with. Um, they are in Kansas, Missouri, Kansas City, Missouri. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Go Kansas City. City of Fountains, and that's the second time the, the uh, that Kansas City has come up in my day today, <laughs> because the USS Kansas is uh, moored in, on the Willamette River. It's, it's sort of Fleet Week here in uh, in Portland, and so there's a couple ships there. And I learned this morning that it's the USS Kansas or Kansas City, I forget which. And that apparently, if you do the onboard tour. Um, everything is themed like all street names from Kansas City and all that kind of stuff. I think Judy has a place there in Kansas in City. Kansas? Yeah, I think that's right. Um, good. So how do we divide and conquer? Go ahead, Klaus. Well, I, I can. Uh, what, what I, I think what I'd like to do next is uh, expand the chapters. Right. So let me just... Uh, what are we... you, want, you want to screen share and scroll around and talk about it? Yeah, let's do that. Um, so this was this one here, and I guess this is storyline and Littervolt, uh, well, the one the story, the choice, and so on. So I thought I had it. There you go. That's um, it. So so what I did is I fleshed out Act One. 
um, from the so it, uh, the the original one goes to synopsis. So then I asked ChatGTP, give me characters. So it 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 builds the characters out here. Sweet. Um, and then then so I brought it to there. And then there's Act Two, the threat. Then we come to pollution, and there's the synopsis. So I can do the same here and assign roles to the characters. Um, and then the battle for survival, and then a ray of hope, and then the resilient garden stewards of the earth, and then there's an epilogue. Um, so and, and, yeah, this is yeah, so so that that's really as far as as so I can flesh that out uh, into this level of detail that we have in the first in the first uh, into in Act One, Scene One. So did you share this also with um, what's her name, Marianne? No, no, okay. I haven't shared this yet. So uh, she's only, she's only seen the first part of prose up to up to the yeah, prompts. She has seen this here, this yeah, the the basically up to here. Okay. So partly I'm wondering if you go ahead and basically start writing a play, the will she feel like well, you've already done a play, or you know, how will her her approach or motivation change? Because um, I like what you're doing. It looks really, really cool. It also feels like you're doing what she volunteered to do. Um, well, the way I would frame it is to say, look, we expanded this a little bit. Doesn't mean that you have to take it uh, from from life. Yeah. We just wanted to give you more uh, of, of a storyline to grab onto. Um, so we are perfectly fine with you using this. Um, we had to put a copyright on it so it wouldn't get completely lost. You know? um, but this is this is the type of copyright we put on there. And we would appreciate you know, a collaboration with you, you know, to spin this out. And, uh, and then, and then uh, you can share it with other churches and then we will also you know, uh, uh, advance this and also with your help and then continue to share it. Uh, but there's a group of people working on this, and so we wanted to uh, we wanted to have to maintain some authorship, you know, over the story. Mm -hmm. That seems um, pretty reasonable to me. Go ahead, Patty. Um, I I'm curious if we have a concern around or something I'm, I'm um, that's coming up for me as a possible concern could be the uh, creative liberty that is taken with this play as it is passed from if it is passed from church to church church. Do we want to have, um, or do we do we need to build in any um, firmer boundaries? Isn't the word, but um, parameters and how, and if so, how do we, um, or maybe we don't s have a part in sustaining that as um, as this grows organically on its own? Do we manage that? Are we concerned? Does anyone else see that as a possibility for concern? Absolutely. Um, I can easily see that that some group would take this and turn it entirely to their to their um, to their own purposes, and and it would be hard to maintain stuff. Um, it's really so. There's there's some forms of copyright that are basically you can't modify this work, which is not what we want. We want people to riff on this work, right? So we can't can't use anything like that. And all those are hard to enforce because people see those and they're like, yeah, whatever. And they they modify them all the time. Anyway. A different form of copyright, or maybe it's something different from copyright, I don't know, or we could bake our own, and I haven't seen this one as one of the legit forms that are out there in the wild right now, is, hey, any derivative work has to point back to the original work. You can do anything you want with this, but there must be a link back to the originating work, which means anybody who sees that and like that notice has got to be visible enough that somebody would see it and be able to go back. But then anybody who sees that could go back and go, well, this is really different from where they started. At least they would notice that. Don't know how much that would help either. But but that's one way to try to dampen drift. Um, the, the One thing is, is drift that's really productive, which is like riffing and remixing and doing exciting and cool new things with it that are consistent with the intentions of the original. Then you have intentional drift where it might even be flipped back 180 degrees to you know, justify industrial agriculture or whatever else. And you don't want that. Uh, I mean, we'd, we'd like to dampen that, that as a possible outcome. So 
I think I think your your concern is pretty justified if we're pursuing a an open hey everybody come in and remix this strategy. Um, and also by the by, if we finish the quick first book and go with Pete and produce a method to take markdown files, roll them up, spit them out as an EPUB or Kindle uh, file format file and get that uploaded to Amazon pretty elegantly. And I'm, that's that's a lot of work uh, that's not gonna happen quickly or easily. But if we can fig figure that out, then we can tell anybody who's gotten pretty far with their version of this work to come back in, do that process and publish their own school or their own church's version of this work. Each of which could be a riff on the original as part of a tree of the work. And then there's like tree and roots and, and all that kind of thing that gets to be an exciting metaphor. And that would be cool too. And that would create a whole series of books that are on the same theme. And the kids could be publishing a book as part of a school project or a church project or whatever else. That, that's, that's kind of cool as well. Uh, sorry, Stacey, you were about to jump in too. Okay, I'm sorry, I have to leave. Um, I'm gonna be away for a few days, so I don't know if I'm gonna make Thursday, but I'll be back next week and I'm really excited. This. This is exciting. So thank you. And I will talk to you all soon. Bye-bye. Cool. Bye, Stacey. Bye, Stacey. And I'm going to be at the Oregon coast for uh, tomorrow through Thursday, but I think Thursday morning, I'll be able to make the OGM call. So next I, I, Monday, I'm out camping. And, and you're camping. I'm, I'm camping. So I'm not sure I have internet. My wife will probably kill me if I try to jump online. <laughs> I think that's very factual, probably, uh, and uh, or at least metaphorically. And so we will not expect you to join uh, next Monday. So we, which means we should figure out how to divide and conquer some of these questions and how to see if we can't answer some of these some of these uh, outstanding questions. Um, yeah, would this be a good time to bring Pete back in? Too early, way too early. Uh, well, for the copyright question, I think a good thing to do would be, uh, I'll, I will rename the Marley channel to Neobooks uh, and Pete is still on it. I don't think he'll he'll drop off it. Uh, so either there or or elsewhere in like the town square, we should just broadly, probably in the town square where there's many more people, um, uh, one of us should ask the question that I just posted in the chat. Um, uh, and Klaus, if you want to ask ChatGPT that question and get an answer and post your, the question and the answer to the town square, that would be really good and that would do it right away. Because uh, I think we need to crowdsource a, a good answer to which copyright uh, to use. Yeah. Um, so, 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 the, so something like, you know, the Neo Book Project uh, is wondering what's the most appropriate copyright to use for a, for a book, <clears throat> for a book that, that is really open and collaborative. Um, that would be terrific. Yeah. Okay. I'm also going to do my first semi-long distance driving adventure in our Nissan Leaf. <laughs> So I'm checking for charging stations and all that kind of stuff. Like, ah, interesting. You, you bought a Nissan Leaf? We got a Leaf last year. It's a, it's a little bit over a year old now. We were not, not up for spending the money of a Tesla. And since a year ago, apparently this guy's, Musk's reputation has soured just a little bit. Um, so we're kind of happy we didn't get a Tesla. But uh, we just got a Leaf and we didn't even get the Leaf V, which has the 100 miles more range. We got the base model because... We thought city driving is pretty much all we're going to do with it. Um, so I have to recharge once on the way to the coast. I could make a beeline to the coast and probably make it on one tank of, uh, of electrons. Uh, but to go down south a bit, I've got to recharge. Yeah. Well, my next car is going to be electric, I'm pretty sure. But I'm going to wait a while. <laughs> the, market, the market is filling up with lots of exciting new models. When we shopped a year and a half ago, um, once we decided not hybrid, um, the, there were really only a couple candidates for a fully electric car. There were not a lot of, and, and once we said no Tesla. Yeah. And now, now there's just a whole really exciting bunch of stuff on the market. Yeah. It's all, all about charging stations at this point. Mm -hmm. And Tesla and GM just made a deal to that GM's going to adopt the Tesla charging uh, protocol. Ford and, as well. Yeah. And think that that could actually swing things a, a lot. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Ford. So that could actually change everybody toward Tesla connectors, which 
and Tesla open sourced their battery technology, but I don't know that they open sourced the charger stuff. I have no idea whether what, you know how broad I'm that was. Sure. Yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, it'd be it'd be pretty cool if we ended up on a good standard because I think those are like the supercharger stations are. Cool. I mean, remember what happened with the uh, the v, v, VHS format beta. Yeah. And yeah. It, it'll, it'll shake itself out. Yeah. Well, as Sony Sony has this habit of inventing better technology and making it proprietary, and then losing the war. Consist yeah. consistently, they, they they have they have great engineering. They they field something that's really good, and then they insist on making it proprietary. Yeah. Sony Sony's been such a dumb company in so many ways. And then Sony Entertainment, same thing. Hmm. Anyway, we're, we're drifting from our topic. I apologize. So, so how about uh, I? And I won't be able to be there Thursday either. I have to bring my RV to the shop uh, ah. Thursday morning, so I'm out of commission for a couple of weeks. Um, but I, I can go online, you know, and find time to work. So I can put this into some sort of book format. You know, you have pages to get to go through. I wouldn't worry about pages at this point. I would just worry about a manuscript of a, and just try to, um, if you want to amplify what you've got there, the Google Doc is going to be perfect for collaborating. If you want to amplify that, that's fine. I, I, but I I wouldn't worry yet about the, the book-like elements. Formatting, okay. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah so, so if I can spin that out, then I can contact... Um, the, uh, the the Kansas church and say, look, we love to work with you. Um, we're, we're working on expanding this, uh, this storyline. Um, do we want to give her already uh, a copy of this rough draft storyline so she can pick it from there and, and, fly, and, and work with it or? So Patty, I'm wondering how you feel on this. My, my own instinct is if you send her a note that says, "Hey, we think that some sort of copyright is important for this, and we're going to sort, you know, we're going to research that," and then B, um, we've you've taken uh, a, 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 an attempt at an outline for a play. You don't have to use it. This is just a particular like riff on doing it. But if you like it, go crazy, use it, and so forth. If you add those things in, I think bringing her in sooner rather than later is a really good thing because then she'll feel like she had a really big hand in in sort of helping create it. Patty, do you differ on any of those things? Um, I, I don't um I don't think so. I think the maybe the the question that's uh, alive for me is at this point, it sounds like the focus is more in getting getting this like what's right in front of us, this possible collaboration with um, what was her, was her name Mary Marion Klaus? Um, hold on, I need to <laughs> if you'll copy her name and paste it into the chat, then we'll all have it. It's uh Marion Thomas. Marion Thomas. Um yeah, so it, it sounds like the um the the imminent priority, the most immediate priority is to to get this moving with her and get this started. And also also we're focusing on the neo book and getting that um to it clear and um a place where where things are moving there. Um, I think that the the question I have is how, just for a moment, hopping back to that cons like possible concern of um, creating some kind of replicable format for this. Once we do have clarity around like what the pro the copyright protocol is for something like this, like um, creating that kind of um, built in um, I don't know what the language is here parameters, things that 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 protect the original idea, protect the integrity of the intention of the original idea. As I said, in these spaces where like there might there may be there may be ignorance of the topic, people wanting to do the best they can and you know creatively elaborate. Um, do we need that? Do we want to have that built in before we bring Marion on board, or are we? Is that maybe further down the road? My own feeling is that the quick first book should, as quickly as we can, <clears throat> link to better materials, richer materials, deeper materials on the wiki. And other resources and pointing to articles and other resources that are out there in the world that we already know about mm -hmm. kind of as quick as possible so that anybody coming in going what's this micro rhizome thing what um, can go read stuff and follow up and and kind of learn about it pretty quickly so that it becomes a learning resource um, as quickly as it's 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 a, a a screenplay but that's just my take on it yeah 
I wonder if there if there's any benefit to um, having pretty clear not to like limit creative um, liberty as this as this moves as this progresses among other communities, but is might it be a good idea to have kind of a clear sense of like what um, the directions we don't want to be moving in in this in this movement, uh, you know, around um, maybe things that might feel kind of familiar and like what people may know around industrialization or practices that are not sustainable, won't be sustainable, and like that might not be even on someone's radar. Do we have really clear language um, naming that so that it's it's that's a really easy place or um, way for people to understand the larger picture of where things are moving in this idea and just just kind of give people a more I don't love you know uh, black and white ways of thinking of things right but sometimes if if there is potential for overwhelm that can be that can feel and create a sense of like safety within absorbing a new idea knowing okay where do I go where do I not go and mm -hmm. who are we to say that to anyone right but I wonder if there's benefits to having some kind of framework like that in built in to this and I don't really know what what are you guys' thoughts uh, it feels like having some guidelines connected to participating in this project would be great of the kind that you just described. Um, if you wanted to take a swing at just writing a couple of paragraphs in this document, maybe at the very bottom, just say, here's some draft guidelines. I'm happy to drop them into a markdown page and connect it to the project and do some of that kind of stuff uh, so that it lives there. Uh, I think we need to sort of be inviting, but also gently structuring how this thing works so that here, here, here are our intentions with this piece and here are things that are going to like fit those intentions and here are things that uh, might not fit those intentions. And I, at that point, when I start saying might not, I don't know how to describe that properly. I don't know how to, I don't know how to prohibit or uh, negatively reinforce stuff we'd rather not have happen here. Um, we kind of have to start with positive energy, make the invite, and see if things turn out directionally um, aligned with where we're aiming. Right? Jerry, was the invitation for me to write those last couple paragraphs of guidelines and parameters, or is that a general invitation? Um, Patty, if you'd like to take a swing at what you were just saying, then then I will try to paraphrase and, and put some in. All right. Right. Oh no. So I'm sorry. The the head shake was just like I'm. I um. I feel really aware of. I feel like I'm swimming and not knowing what I don't know. And so I think I feel kind of cautious um, around. I, I'm afraid I wouldn't be able to provide much in the direction of what you're suggesting that would feel valuable because I'm I'm learning here in this space. Part of me being um, my coming back to this project is to learn and engage and um and to learn. And so I I don't know that I feel like I'm, um, qualified. Um, that's, that's, none, that's, of us, none of us. Is yeah, perfect. none of us is pretty good. <laughs> exactly. Um, um, part part of what caused me to ask you was that I really liked what you said just before about that, and it was like you may you may have no experience doing that, but your instincts on it were very good, and the way you were framing and phrasing things I really liked. So that's why I I, I was sort of mm -hmm. asking if you'd like to take a swing at it, but I'm happy to. Thanks Patty, for the clarification. This is, also, this is also a great opportunity to play with Chat GPT. Mm. And frame your and focus on framing your question instead of looking for answers. Mm. Because I mean, look at this thing. I wrote this this script there in like you know thirty minutes. No, yeah. Um, it's just, but but you you really have to uh, uh, sort of almost meditate on what are you asking now mm. and what's the what's the question. Um, because if you miss that question just a little bit, you get nothing. You know, garbage. Yeah. So that's that's and that's really a skill. My my son is all over this, right? I mean, he's uh, head of talent branding for Samsara, and and so he's very much challenged, you know, with uh, having to think of stuff that he has no background in. Mm -hmm. So he's using AI, and he's they're, they're actually now programs that teach you how to ask the right questions or how to frame questions. So if you look at it from this as an exploration. You know, of what am I, what answers am I seeking? You know, that lead, will lead you to the questions that that uh, uh, that, that you need to ask. Um, programs, I think, I think this means courses or online courses or other things. Right. Like that. I think that's what class means. Prompt craft would be if if I wanted to follow that trail, that would be the the language yeah. used to. Awesome, thank you. Prompt, prompt engineering is probably the more common term. Prompt craft, prompt craft nice. is probably the warmer term. Nice.
Yeah, Thank but you. if you but if you want to search that the that's the way to go. You, you'll be amazed how smart you are. I mean, you, <laughs> when ChatGPT gives you this, wow, you know, amazing Thanks. response. Thanks for the encouragement from both of you. I appreciate it. Um, and Jerry, I would I would like to try that. I'll try to take a crack at that. And which document am I adding that to? The one, the the joys of soil, the one we were just yeah, looking okay. at. Great. Um, cool. Just just go all go all the way to the bottom, and if if you've added something, then just uh, are you you're on the Mattermost, right? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, if you if you add anything and you'd like us to take a look at it, just mention it um, in the channel in the soon to be renamed Neo Books channel. Okay. And we'll go look. Okay. Thanks. And by the way, just so it, because I'm I have to rename that file. Um, to to protect it, it's in the Mali shared folder. Um, hold okay. on, let me just get this. So make sure that you have it. Who who originated that folder? Was that me? Was that you? Uh, Pete. Oh, it's Pete. Okay, so uh, we should ask Pete to rename the folder, and that that should work. Okay. Yeah. So, um, here is here is the folder. So so then that's where the files are located. Cool. Thank you. I, yeah, will, you want to I will I will send Pete a request to rename the folder. Cool. And I will go now and uh, change the names on the mattermost and such. Okay, so do we have a we have a plan? I think we have some marching orders. Feels good. Yeah. Feels exciting, and it feels like if we get the dynamics right and get the invite right and start start some activities that we can, this can start sort of mo moving beyond our little circle here. Yeah. And and if we if we get that going, then we go back to OGM and we say, hey people, we've been out doing this neo book thing. We now have this 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 happening. Please join us. Bring your ideas. Let's let let's you know riff on them, and then you know. As soon as we have something that smells like a book or a, or a script or something like that, we go to Pete and we're like, hey, Pete, how do we turn this thing into an EPUB? Yeah. And when we, when we broaden this out, we may have members who know someone who can really make this fly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Because we have some really well-connected people. I think one of the characteristics of NeoBooks, and maybe I'm wrong about this, is that the first edition of a neo book is kind of like you know version one of software is like alpha software but the book might actually improve dramatically in revisions um because it might be started as a almost like a placeholder for a set of ideas that are kind of vague and oh. that are that are casting for a community to make them better and it could be that rev three major revision three of a neo book is in fact the one that starts to feel like, oh, okay, this is really congealing. This is making sense, as opposed to our normal way of doing books now, which is like V1 better damn well be the best book you can possibly write around the topic with everything you want to say, because we don't go back and revise books that often. It's a, and, and it doesn't happen for like three years. So something like that. I'm trying, I'm trying to mess around with the, not, the, the, the notion of a book a lot here. Uh, please go ahead, Penny. Yeah. Um, question about the neobook, and then a uh, question about the soil. Can we call it the soil project? Is there? Did we decide on a name for? We the, were calling um, food revolt. Was where we were on food the picture. Okay. This, this doesn't feel like the title of a play for a church. So no. I think, I, I think the I think the book uh, right now is the joys and sorrows of soil. Okay. Okay. Do we? Um, is anyone going to be bothered if I call it the soil project? If um, for sounds, for short. Okay. Sounds great. Okay, great. Um, question about neo books. Um, is so is is it? Um, and I did look on the website a little bit the other day, but it didn't feel clear to me whether or not this was um neo books or something that um like this is more of a collaborative space rather than like the single ownership, um, uh, method of book writing that I'm familiar with. It sounds like you know someone can create this neo book. Uh, the idea can be and is encouraged to be shared among communities, and there's collaboration among growing the idea. Or can it still be? Can neo books still be? the more um, one person doing doing the thing. And it's just a new platform for people to do that on. So on my to-do list, which I ignored over the weekend, was to record some videos explaining neobooks better. Oh, nice. Cool. I look forward um, to it. Yeah, thank you. And then what you just asked needs to be explained in there as well. But the notion is to just sort of rethink how books work in our society and mm -hmm. and to... to <clears throat> 
to harness the fact that everybody knows what a book is. Even people who hate reading books know what books mm -hmm. are. Mm -hmm. Um, so books are extremely familiar cultural artifacts, mm -hmm. uh, but then to dissolve what's wrong or broken about books, and then to change how books get made and manifest in the world in some productive way. Super, super, and well explained. Thank you. That's that's exciting to to consider. Um, cool. The question about um, so earlier we had said one of the the um, to do points we could be focusing on is building relationships with people who can help. I'm curious um, in in both of your opinions who would be um, uh, the kinds of people who you would see, um, like might be sympathetic to what we're trying to do and what kind of people are we trying to recruit to, to help? Is this playwrights? Is this people who are, you know, have a background in theater? What areas are we needing support in that, as we acknowledge, it doesn't sound like any of us really have a lot of experience, at least I don't, in the world of, um, play and making plays and things of that nature. And I can start thinking of people in this community. I can, I, think, I can reach out to. I think yes, all of the above of everybody you just said. <clears throat> Klaus, I don't know who else comes to mind for you. I, I was just thinking I have a friend from very long ago who got really good at writing children's songs. Mm. Yeah, so, so I think this, this we sort of serendipitously fell into this children's play and book and wonderful idea, but now it just opens up, you know, a whole new era a whole new area of uh, exploration right and when i was still living in germany when i came back to germany i was really getting uh, 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 enamored with experimental art you know experimental place hmm. uh, with can i mean i mean just really uh um uh very symbolic kind of of uh, um, place you know and this would really lend itself for something like this, you know, um, where you you can have uh, an interaction with ballet and and expression, you know, to to convey the, the joy and the agony, you know, of of soil, um, and and so that could that could become very easily uh, a, an adult theme, you know, as well. Um, so this, so you could this play could be layered, you know, to to uh, different audiences. Um, if it continues to resonate, I mean, I was amazed how. I mean, instantly I had feedback in the Sierra Club. We need to put this on our website. Wow, story. I mean, that that really blew me away. You know? So, so I really like the idea that there is a seed document that's pretty good. It's like it's already pretty good, like the story you wrote, and it doesn't need to be huge and long. It can just be a seed document. Then from that, a whole variety of things grow, including a children's play for churches that is customizable to your particular community and your bioregion, for example, but also an experimental theater piece that is half composed by ChatGPT and turns into a performance thing for community theaters or whoever is interested in experimental you know, theater. That, that would be super, super interesting. Uh, but but that each of them points back to the seed and says, I have germinated from and sprouted from and branched away from this thing over here that started this. And 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 this becomes a new a new kind of work where there's a theme. <clears throat> and I drank too much coffee this morning. Sorry, my throat is all kind of phlegmy. Um where there's there, there's clearly a theme and a direction, and then it just kind of organically sprouted a whole series of manifestations through the mycelial network. Oh, the five levels of difficulty thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah and I, I misnamed the book uh, earlier. I called it the understory. It's actually the novel is called the overstory. Mm -hmm. And and I'm I think we should have maybe a couple little examples of um, fictional stories around healing the earth you know and, and nature and all that kind of stuff and i think there's a there's a genre there that if we sort of plumb a little bit we'll find some this is another good question for chat gpt yeah i mean but really our conversation last week with sunil and and who, who was the other gentleman uh who was with us um, uh barry as barry yeah barry it's uh, barry very i mean that was that that was inspiring because you know, it's just riffing through. How do you reach people? You know, uh, so so that you cut under you you flow underneath this wall you know, of uh, uh, rejections on so many levels, right? How can you 
flew underneath and and so that that got me to think about why don't we experiment along those lines love that sounds great go ahead patty um yeah Klaus, kind of riffing on that i um what's been uh just maybe as a, as a larger um kind of zooming out a few levels something that's been present for me and as i'm thinking of how you know in, in my own the work i'm doing and the messages that i want to be bringing how can we how did you say it that said really beautifully said slip underneath the wall of uh you said it really well um but i think i think what's um occurring to me as i'm kind of striking out in the world of entrepreneurship and business for the first time there's all of this um in the sphere that i'm in it's like the self-help um coaching um wellness um uh space there's so much messaging around um uh the mo the the most effective way to market to people right now and um so much of it really does feel incredibly um uh to me feels very manipulative which i understand that's you know kind of what you know that's not a new story in marketing but i'm i'm it, it feels like to me though the larger theme and a lot of the messages i'm getting is that there's this belief that the the only way to reach people to cut through the noise is to you know is shock value is um you know kind of the the, the cheaper ways of getting attention and i i'm i'm finding myself feeling curious about like what would it look like to trust that people still are tapped into their own personal power and 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 can can still respond to something that isn't what we're used to right and it's almost you know as as i'm trying to figure out okay what is my own um effort look like in this space and i i really don't want to move in the direction I'm being encouraged and the, the only way I'm told is like the only way to do it and I, I really believe that there's possibly I hope there's potential in appealing to people in a different way that isn't you know I can have all the cheap tricks that's my language for it and I, I kind of I'm wondering if if maybe that suspicion might be around the um close to the um the fulcrum point where where there is this paradigm tipping and shifting away from and out of um, affecting and um, moving people through what I would call disempowering means and into this new space where we're actually coming back to um, more, I don't know, like pure or more effective ways. I don't really know what I'm with the language I'm trying to, to find, but um, moving out of the way people are targeted and manipulated and into this space where like, I, I still think, I hope, I trust, I hope there's, we can still respond in a different way. And so I wonder if, and I don't know, if, A, I don't know if that made, if that made sense, it, it was kind of me trying to verbally process it out loud, but if, if that feels resonant, I wonder if we can um, bring that, weave that into this project somehow. I had a, I got into a discussion with Noah Bateson on one of the workshops, the, uh, uh, there was this workshop, Future, I mean, some some future focused uh, uh, group, and you know, we had some. We had uh, we had Daniel uh, Ball in there. I mean, we had some really interesting speakers that came to it. But she was like adamant, you know, that we should not and never use the uh, money. What, what she called, what she considered the manipulated the manipulation tactics of you know the counterside and so on. And my point was, well, how do you reach people? You know? I mean, you, 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 why would you call it manipulation? I mean, when you, um, when you engage with different population groups, then you have to engage them um, uh, in the space where they are. So if I change my language in order to match that person's language so they can hear me, is this manipulative? Well, in some ways you could argue, yes, it is, but you could also say, well, no, uh, I want to be heard. Now and and so I need to get within the context of that individual or, or that group of people more likely um, to to uh, to modulate the message in ways that it can resonate. So what we found with this kind of story is that people really have deeply held emotional angst uh, about what they see going on around them. I mean, people see you know the the uh, new york uh, darkened out by forest fires from canada and crowds and storms and you know all these uh, horrible stories so people are really alarmed you know and so they don't but they don't want to be at the same time there are so many conflicting messages right to 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 that are in the in the play here so this story 
um, connected, you know, at a really deep seated, uh, uh, almost DNA level uh, uh, connection, you know, because uh, I can really relate to life in the soil, you know, and, and Mr. Soil and so on. So that's perfectly okay because we're doing it for good reasons. You know? yeah. We're not, we're, we're, uh, you know, if you get people to do the right thing, it's this manipulation. You know? uh, so, so, yeah, I understand the, the and I, I did not come to an agreement with Madison. She was just like adamant, you know, that this is just a, not the next uh, path towards uh, bad things. But you know, I don't know how else you would reach people that uh, that are so removed. Otherwise, so we don't. <clears throat> we've forgotten how to reach people besides um, plundering their data to figure out what they're looking at, manipulating that data to create a message, and then and then filling their environment with noise that is often either temptations they can never fulfill or fears that they should respond to. Um, and that's the world of modern mod, modern mass marketing. And I think what Patty voiced really beautifully just now is, hey, can we actually make a success out of this and reach people by having something compelling, meaningful, contagious, um, because it helps people like connect and fix things and tell stories and 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 sort sort out really complicated issues in a relatively simple way. And I'd love to be able to do that. That would be terrific. I um I felt really um I, I can we can we circle back around just for a moment so that um explain things in different levels of difficulty I, I if if we're um Jerry you were mentioning and you've been highlighting the importance of like man if we can just really get clear on this first neo book and create this really simple really um easy to replicate and a framework that can you know be expounded upon organically maybe without us having to to push it to to do so we just create this really solid framework to begin with and then you know things can grow from there um I I. I would be inclined to think that it could be really valuable to get clear on like, you know, and, and then I'm, I'm afraid I wouldn't be able to help much in, in this idea, but Klaus, you know, you strike me as someone who has, you seem to have a really good pulse on the, um, the um, pop conversations around environment, you know, the, the environmental movement and some of the things that a lot of people um, seem to find emotionally compelling that may not also um, be accurate or a great representation of the, the actual problems. And um, this is just um, based on the emails I read from you and the conversations I've observed in the OGM mailing list. I wonder if there's some way we could um, build out, you know, the, the core message, which I've heard you verbally express on these calls before. And I, I think it's done really well, you know, how you capture what seems to me to be this really broad and complicated and complex issue and pare it down in a way that's like pretty easy to understand and digest. Um, and, you know, so if that, if that verbal expression might be the bare bones of the idea, can we um, work up from there and work down from there, clearly identifying levels of simplicity and complexity, addressing, and maybe even thinking, okay, what populations might be even just in, th um, in this first expression of this play in this neo book, what populations might we hit first? Can we, and then, you know, where might the trajectory of that idea lead outside of that? We can't know that, but I wonder as a thought exercise, if it would be valuable to just start conceptualizing, like what kinds of people might be hearing this message? What maybe, you know, what could they be feeling when they hear it? And how can we um, package this in a way that's accessible to as many different kinds of people as possible that may be hearing it? So um, I don't know how, I don't know how that would work, right? But I, I'm, I'm attracted to the idea of really clearly defining and articulating levels of um, complexity or simplicity around the core idea and having um, just means and methods of easy deployment, or at least um, just like a place where each idea lives. And so that'd even be helpful maybe for the, the group as this group begins to grow, it might be helpful um, to have that bed of knowledge for anyone who is curious about learning more about this and really um, showing up to these conversations from a place of wanting to be a little more informed and um it just it's also something i haven't seen before in the world this you know idea packaged in a way that's accessible to anyone so i'm attracted to the idea of creating levels of clear levels of simplicity or complexity that feel accessible it might be a good starting point for the neo book too thoughts so then and the the quick the the quick first book feels like the first level whatever wherever we choose that's the first level then mm -hmm. subsequent 
uh, riffs would take it to different levels and do other do other kinds of spins on it. I think, but the we, we need to pick one place for the first the first level, um, the first version of this, uh, from which all these other things can sprout. And and doing the different levels sounds like a task for GPT uh, as a start. Uh, I, I, as we were talking earlier, I was like, wouldn't it be cool once we get a play to ask ChatGPT to turn the play into a screenplay? Uh, per like a Wes Anderson movie, uh, like a Wes Anderson and uh, like a Wes Anderson stop motion animation movie or something like that, mm. and, and and then ask one of the video generator uh, generative AIs to go make that movie, right? It's like like very interesting things spin out of this pretty quickly given where we are with the confluence of of technology and humans and nature. Sorry, Klaus, you were going to say something. Yeah, no, I'm actually connected with filmmakers. Uh, the uh, uh, who who, but you have to come to the table with money is the problem. So we have to. How about know, with creative ideas? Does that yeah. solve the problem? They're saying, yeah, we love the creative ideas. So damn it, money to bring with it. Damn uh, it. So we would have to come and bring a funder to the table. Yeah, I mean, in my previous pre-retirement life, my last job, I was uh, the head of corporate target group marketing and. Um, my big and, and that was really a fascinating thing because we were operating in 30 countries and I had a team of analysts in each country and then we got divided in Eastern Europe, Western Europe and Asia. Wow. And so I would meet once a quarter, I would have uh, uh, a training session uh, in either one of those regions. And then once a year we had, we brought everybody to Dusseldorf and had you know, uh, uh, the, a global group there. And what, the core principle was is uh, that segmentation is the best predictor of behavior, right? So you you so when you when you bring your target groups down to defining commonalities within a group. Now, in this case, it was buying behavior and assortment selections and so on and so on. But when you when you uh, combine when you segment people, and this is really I mean this is the power of what Facebook did, uh, you know, during the 2016 elections uh, with with the scandal there, you know, because they gave enough data out there that allowed uh, uh, the segmentation of people into groups, and then you could customize messages to those groups. You know, unfor unfortunately, at that time, for nefarious reasons. You know? Um, but you can also do it for good reasons. Now you can. So when you're dealing with a group, with a church group like this, you know their mindset, and you know, you know what stimulates them, words that attract them, uh, the emotional context within which you know a Christian group operates, um, and so that's all important. So you know, as we discover another target group, we can then modulate the story. To address that target group in ways that, so for example, when I'm saying abstract theater, well, that's uh, you know that attracts a group of more intellectually you know, uh, uh, theoretical formed uh, 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 audiences, you know that elevates this to a, a whole different level. You know? um, so we can play with that as we go along. Right now, we have an opportunity to get this church group going you now, and which which is so replicable because if we can get this right then that story could travel yeah. um i'm going to paste a video in the chat that i made some time ago let's see when i put it in my brain 2016 called advertising is war uh and mm -hmm. i've used this riff in a couple of speeches and it would be lovely if we could lose Mar you know, target markets and all that kind of language. <laughs> um, so uh, my own amateur theory of this, this, this is a piece of what's in the, the videos is, at the end of World War II is when major media all come together to form the media environment we were familiar with until the internet. TV takes off after World War II like crazy. TV exists before World War II, but it's just a fledgling thing. After World War II, everybody uh, goes from having a radio in the Great Depression to, wow, boom times, TV. Um, and a whole bunch of uh, veterans come out of Europe uh, and go and and the Pacific, and they go to and so many of them go to Madison Avenue and become ad men, like like the movie, like the series Mad Men, and they get to Madison Avenue and they're like, oh, I recognize this. This is just like strategic bombing. 
The weapons are packages of messages, which in, the, in those days you make a media buy into newspapers, into magazines, onto television, whatever else. We didn't have integrated media campaigns. None of that was existed really yet. But the messages, the missiles or the bombs are basically messages. Like, you know, we send flights of messages like flights of missiles, like the MLRS that are, that are bombing Ukrainians right now, uh, back and forth. Um, and so we do market penetration. We uh, pay, for, pay by the impression because we're actually making invisible psychological dents on people's brains by dropping these messages in front of them all the time. And it's violence. This is violence at every turn that we have normalized. And so the reason, the reason my old boss, Esther Dyson, thought that the word consumer didn't matter so much was that she had perfectly normalized away all this kind of behavior, which is the behavior of consumer mass marketing. Um, and I hate it. I can't stand it. But we've lost something. I'll just echo what I said earlier. We've lost our understanding of how else to get word out. And it's entirely possible. I watched as instant messaging showed up as a little blip on the radar and then ate the world. And do you know how much how much marketing uh, budget the early five or six instant messaging companies had? Zero. I am buddy lists ate the world because they were really useful and extremely contagious. Now later it gets complicated to the point where you've got Twitter and stuff like that, and it's just like there's like a mess going on now. But but really early that was just super useful technology that that caught fire because it was incredibly useful. And I loved that. I loved watching. Uh, at one point, I was on a Manhattan bus, and somebody yelled to somebody else as they were getting off the bus, "I am me that." And I'm like, "We have reached mainstream. Like, like instant messaging is no longer a curiosity for geeks. This is mainstream totally." And that made me very happy. Yeah, and I think that was also the point that Noah Peterson tried to make, and we sort of you know, flew by each other because. Um, I mean, from a very practical, I mean, I, I love to adjust my vocabulary, you know, to to uh, express meaning in different ways. Um, but it's basically, you know, you 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 do what you're doing for the right reasons. I mean, it's the intention behind what you're doing. You know? Yeah, exactly. Well, cool. Um, Go ahead, Patty. Sorry. Oh, sorry. I was going to say, I, um, I dropped this in. This was just an account. Um, I started following in uh, 2018. Um, at the time, she had 200,000 followers. And um, and and like and content of her page aside, this is just an example of someone who, like, there, there's never any advertising, doesn't market, has a podcast, has a channel, doesn't have any affiliate or, you know, um, like she she just presents her message and people tell each other about it because it resonates because there, I, I don't um, read She's, I think she's very careful about uh, avoiding um, shameful, shaming language in the content that she posts. And it just grew organically. She's almost at 7 million followers. That was five years ago. Um, and uh, so 200,000 to 7 million, not yeah. by any traditional outreach, right? It was just a message that people really resonated with and shared. And this is just a lot of word of mouth organic growth. And so I do, I have hope that it's possible, right? You know, I see it. It sounds like we've, we've, we've seen that kind of... Um, um, growth occur. And so, yeah, I, I, I have hope and I think it's possible and would love to grow that in our own way, if Sounds possible. Great. Love that. Thanks. Well, we all have some work. <laughs> um, Klaus, one more thing to just put in your uh, ear as you head off to camp and stuff like that. Um, what else does the quick first book need? Does it need a closing chapter that's like an epilogue about what you might do right now? Is that even appropriate for the quick first book? Uh, does it need an intro? Because um, because what what you've got is is a nice body, but what else what else would make it feel like a book like work? Um, and I'm thinking that there is a little book, and then there's a play. But I, but mm -hmm. it could be that there's first a play, and I don't know. But I'm I'm not sure that the play should be the very first output here. I think that there is a book. Yeah. Then I, I mean I I will have to um, this play sort of came in and and disrupted the flow in a good way. In a really good way, I think. From this call anyway but uh um yeah going back to the book i can separate the two probably makes sense to separate the two um i would think i like to bring in some context about stewardship you know the, the i think that would be 
that would be a good addition, maybe almost a closing argument. Mm -hmm. uh, let me play with it a little bit. If you can think of a chapter to add, then uh, let me know. You know uh, um, that yeah, that would be helpful. Sounds good. I just need to play with it a little bit. We can all think about that. Thank you. Very good. Well, thank you. Awesome. Enjoy your camping. Yeah, mm -hmm. Patty, I'm so glad you're you're doing this. You know. Yeah, thank you for being bringing a really important perspective to us. You know? Thank you. Thank you for saying that, Klaus. It's 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 fun. I really enjoyed our call today. This was a lot of fun. I yeah. Look forward to next to next week. And yeah, and enjoy your camping. And uh, Jerry, your trip is the next tomorrow. Yeah, tomorrow morning I, I drive to the coast. Cool. Have fun. Good luck, and I'll thank see you, you all soon. Stay juiced. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Bye.